I'd like to invite you to give ear to the reading of God's Word. We're in James chapter 2 today and reading verses 14 through to, to verse 24. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, goodbye and have a good day, stay warm, eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself is not enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith and others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on your altar. You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened just as the scriptures say. Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. And I, I'd, I'd love it if you'd please uh, join me in prayer, uh, that we'd pray for each other, and, and definitely if y'all pray for me, <laughs> that'd be great. So let's pray together. God, we do thank you. We thank you for your word, because as your word says, it is, uh, Lord, inspired. It is God-breathed. We thank you that you inspired James, that you put this message on his heart because you knew the church in that day and the church today needs to hear it. And Lord, we thank you that your word is inspired not just in the writing, but again, Lord, in the hearing, that it is alive and active and that your word is powerful, that, Lord, when you send forth your word, it doesn't return to you empty. So, Lord, we pray for the accomplishment of all you have in mind in our lives by your holy word today. Lord, speak into our lives just as we need to hear and as you do, Lord, give us the faith to respond, not just being hearers, but doers of your word. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, this morning, we're continuing our series through the book of James in this series that we've called Holy Living or, or Living That's Set Apart for God, Holy Living in an Angry Culture. And, you know, we, we've made this observation about the anger in our culture, and it's a real sad thing that, um, you know, that anger sort of ramped up in the last few days in some real uh, dangerous ways. And, uh, and so we're obviously very concerned about that. There are calls for unity, and there's uh, calls for more civility in our public discourse, and, and you know, certainly that should be true. Um, but what is also certain, what is also certainly true, is that if what is broken in our culture is going to be healed, what is broken in people's lives is going to be healed, it will take far more than just civility. Because, you know, it's not just anger. And in fact, anger is just a symptom of, of a deeper spiritual issue. You know, we, we see things in our culture like uh, literally record levels of depression and, and anxiety and even, even outright despair and great loneliness in our culture. And... And you know, um, all of those are pointing us back toward a very real spiritual need. Um, it, it's real interesting, and not interesting in a good way. It's real interesting to me, though, that we live in, and, and if you look historically, this is really true, we live in the wealthiest nation that there's ever been. We live in the safest nation that there ever has been. It may not feel that way now, but if you look historically, that, that really is true. And, and yet, all of these other things, all of this other brokenness of our culture still exists. And, and so it indicates to me that there's something deeper going on here than just what wealth could, could sort of solve, what uh, you know, safety could solve. There's something deeper, and in fact, that is as deep as our souls. As deep as our souls. Uh, St. Augustine, he actually, I think he named this so well hundreds of years ago when he, he said this. 
He said, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds rest in thee. You see, the brokenness in people's lives, the brokenness in our culture, uh, it, it actually can be traced back to this fact. And it is a fact that God has made us, and God has made us for, him, for himself. And it is God alone who can draw us back to himself, and he has chosen to do that through Jesus. And so, if I could just kind of, you know, give a summary uh, here, it, it would be this, that what our culture really needs, really needs, is Jesus. He is the one that our culture really needs. And so what our culture really needs then from us is that we would be a people who live our faith out in very visible ways. You know, what the world doesn't need that James talks about here is a faith in name only. You know, just a faith where we kind of think that some things are true. The world doesn't need that sort of faith. The world needs the sort of faith where we are living in such a way that people see that, that God is good. Our lives actually give Him glory. Show how good God is, how good life in Jesus is. Is. And, and what we know is that this salvation offered in Jesus, that it comes to us through faith, right? And so today, really, we're just, is all about faith, focusing on faith, that the world needs us to have faith and to live our faith out. And, and the way that we're going to dig into this is by talking, first of all, um, first of all, about the fact that salvation is through faith, that we are saved through faith. See, the salvation that's been provided for us, it is provided for us through Jesus. That is, through his life, his death, and his resurrection. There's a salvation, there's a restoration to God that is provided for us through him. And, and the way that we access that salvation, the way that we, we receive it, obtain it, the way we have it is through faith. That is, through putting our trust in Jesus, actually accepting him in our lives. And when James asked this question, and, and if you look at it one way, it, it seems very negative, but there's a positive side of this question too. He asked the question, can that kind of faith save anyone? And obviously it sounds kind of negative, right? It's a critique of one kind of faith, but on the other side of it, it's a real indication that there is actually a faith that saves, right? That's a real positive side of this. If he's asked, can this kind of faith save, then there must be another sort of faith that actually does bring salvation. And here it is, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Salvation is by grace. It's a, it's a gift of God's free and loving work in Jesus Christ. It is a gift. And it's, it's so important to, to keep this in the front of our minds, that everything necessary for salvation was accomplished by Jesus on the cross. It's not Jesus and something else. It is Jesus and him alone, right? He accomplished our salvation because the alternative, and is the temptation of the broken human heart again and again to go back to this place, the alternative and the temptation is to lapse into self-righteousness. That is, to think that we could somehow earn our salvation, that we could, somehow, we could somehow prove that we're good enough, that God has to accept us. There are whole religions that are based upon this, this self-righteousness, that if I do enough good, if I'm a good enough person, then God will have to receive me, right? And even, listen, we even see this in the secular world. There is this desire for folks to be seen as a, quote, good person, right? And, and the way this goes, the system is that if you don't do anything horrible, right? I haven't done anything horrible. And if you throw in some good deeds, then you can say, you know what? I'm a good person. Ta-da, right? I'm a good person. The problem is really two things. Problem number one is that it doesn't really work. <laughs> Self-righteous, self-righteousness never has worked and it never will work. And part of what I mean by that is that, listen, there's enough darkness going on in, in our hearts and minds, if we're real honest about it, there's enough darkness going on in there that, that we know we can only fool ourselves for so long. There's enough failure trailing along behind us that we know that we can only fool ourselves so long. But that's only part of why it doesn't work. The other side of this, the truth is that actually, actually, we don't get to set the standard of what it means to be a good person. We are made by God. This is the truth. And if we are made by God, then actually 
our maker gets to determine the standard, right? He gets to actually say, not, not we, he gets to say what the standard is. And get this, this is incredible. The standard is Jesus. And I mean, that's an incredible thing. We are made in the image of God, and Jesus is the very image of God. He is the radiance of the glory of God. And so in him, we see the standard. He lived the life that we really should have lived, but have failed to do so. He is the only one in all of history who has actually lived a perfect, sinless life life he is the standard and if you look at Jesus for very long then you kind of figure out well I don't think I'm gonna be that good <laughs> maybe I'm gonna need a little help here right and so we know that our salvation will never be on our merits it'll be on his merits and so here's how this works this is what the scriptures tell us that when the gospel is proclaimed when, when someone talks about the love of God for you, that even though, even though as a human race we've turned away from God, we've done that individually, even still God loves us so much that He sent His only begotten Son that whoever would believe in Him would have eternal life, would not perish but have everlasting life. And someone shares the gospel of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, here's how good God is. Here's how he, he wants faith for us so much. He wants salvation for us so much that the Holy Spirit will confirm that truth in the hearts of those who are open to hearing it. That's what God will do. You know, John Wesley talks about this, and this is the whole reason why there is a Methodist church. If John Wesley does not have that experience, the Methodist church doesn't exist. That's what burns in his heart to see other people experience what he did. He talks about this, his alders get experience, that he was overwhelmed with the love of God. He said that he realized in that moment, as his heart was strangely warmed, that Jesus had died for him, even for him, to forgive him of his sins. That's how good God is. He, he confirms this truth, of the good news, and all we have to do is say yes to his love. He enables us in our bodies to feel and know his love, and all we have to do is just say yes. But then the question is, what comes next, right? What does that look like the next day and, and the day after that? What does faith look like after that? You know, apparently, apparently in the very earliest days of the church, and if you remember, we talked about the book of James, how, you know, there are many scholars that actually think it's the very earliest of the writings of the New Testament, but it's at least very early, even if it's not the very earliest. And so from the very earliest days of the church, there are people who are having this experience. They are giving their lives to Christ. And yet, here's what they're doing the next day and the day after. They have decided that they really want to try to keep control of their own lives. I want to control what I do, when I do it, what I say. And so, I want to keep control of my life and yet still claim Jesus as my Savior. Apparently, that was going on from the earliest days of the church. There is a cheapening of the grace of Jesus Christ to say, you know what, Jesus, I want salvation from you, but I don't really want to give you my life. I want to get from you, but I don't really want to give you my life. I want salvation from you, but I'm not so sure that I want all of you in my life. And that, friends, is a serious, that is a serious failure of trust in the Lord. And that's why the Apostle Paul, why he pushes us so much in the Scriptures, he says things like this, we are not our own. We were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Right? We don't belong to ourselves anymore. You can't give yourself to Christ and still belong to yourself. He says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And Jesus himself, teaching the true nature of faith, he says this, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will find it. And this really brings us to our second point, and that is this faith that saves. What does that actually look like? What does that mean? When James asked that question, is this the kind of faith that can save someone? What is he actually pointing to? What is this faith he, that saves? What is that actually? And, and to get at this, we really have to dig into each of these words. What is, what is faith and what is salvation? And I'll give you the short answer, <laughs> but I hope you hang on for the long one, okay? So here's the short answer. The short answer is that faith and salvation are about relationship. They're about relationship with God. So that's the short answer. Here's the long one, okay? You ready? Let's talk about faith for a minute here. 
What, what is faith? You know, um, Christians, uh, critics of the Christian faith, uh, they will criticize faith, and what they say is that faith is this willingness, either because we're just, really, we got a lot of wishful thinking going on, or, or maybe we're just deluded, but critics of the Christian faith will say we are willing to believe in plausible things, and that that's what faith is, right? That's how they define faith. But I've got some good news, that we don't actually have to worry about that, because the Bible says that's not actually what faith is. The faith isn't just about thinking certain things are true, whether they're plausible or implausible, that that's not what faith is. This is what James says. As he's inspired by the Spirit, he says, you say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. See, the demons know that there's one God. They know this. And yet, it doesn't change their relationship with God. They're still enemies of God, and because of that, they're still terrified of the judgment. Faith must be something more. Listen, I, what I want you to hear, first of all, <laughs> is that the facts of the Christian faith are entirely plausible. Right? I don't want you to go away thinking that I've said, I'm not sure if they're plausible or not. Listen, that's, the biblical worldview has the most explanatory power of any way of understanding the world in which we live. Amen? And not only that, not only that, but the evidence for Jesus, for his life, his death, his resurrection, the evidence for Jesus, I believe, is absolutely incontrovertible. Right? It just is. And so I would say that the Christian faith is entirely plausible. But it is not enough just to think that it is true. It is not just about words and affirmations and explanations and arguments and so. It is about a relationship. It is about an intimacy with God. It is about a daily walk with the Lord. This is, a, this is an amazing statement about Abraham. He was even called the friend of God. I don't know about you, but I want to be called the friend of God. So why? Why, did, why is he called the friend of God? And it is simply this. He believes God enough. He trusts God enough to do what he says. <laughs> he trusts God enough to allow God to be God, even though he may not understand everything. He trusts God enough to humble himself and let God be God. And so he is called a friend of God. Jesus says this too. This is really cool. John 15, 15, he says to his disciples, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are, you remember? My friends. My friends. Since I have told you everything the Father told me, Jesus shares the heart of the Father with them. Jesus shares the heart of the Father to see humankind restored to himself. And they say, you know what? I want that for my life. I don't want to just get things from God. I want that. I want God himself in my life. And here's where we're going to shift then to talking about salvation. To talking about salvation and again about relationship James says in the scriptures here that there is a kind of faith that is in faith in name only it's only about thinking things and saying things a faith in name only and he says that that kind of faith is useless and dead and yet there's another kind of faith he says that is alive and it is a faith where we are walking in humble obedience with the Lord where we are walking in intimacy and delight in him he says you see his faith and his actions about Abraham worked together his actions made his faith complete and i want to just camp out on that word for a minute that word complete because it's really important in the bible especially we see in the new testament again and again this word complete or it's also translated fulfilled and so what this is about is that god says something is going to be so he's going to do something and when it happens it is said to be fulfilled it is completed it's what god wants to have happen and so when Jesus says that he hasn't come to abolish the law, he hasn't come to abolish the scriptures, but to fulfill the scriptures, what he means is that he has come to bring the point of the Bible, the point of the scriptures, the purpose to fruition, to completion. And that is that he has come to bring salvation. That's what this book is about. It is about bringing people to salvation. And so when we read here that our faith and our obedience, our good works, they work together to complete our faith, what it's saying is that these things work together to bring about the point, 
the purpose of God for our faith, which is salvation. That's the whole point. That's what faith is driving toward. And he says that these two things, our faith and our works, work together to complete it, to bring us to salvation. So what does that mean? Salvation, it means salvation is way more than just avoiding hell. I am really happy about that part of faith, right? I am for avoiding hell, right? I'm for getting into heaven. But faith is way more than, or salvation rather, is way more than that. And, and salvation is about way more than just extending life when our bodies wear out. And I'm way in favor of that too, right? That's really great. But it's actually way more than that. It is about being restored to God. It is. You know, we were made for God. We were made to, to glorify Him, to show how good He is. We are made to delight in Him. Can you imagine a God so good? That he would make us just so that we could be happy in him. And salvation is to be restored to him. Is to be remade in the image of God in which we were created in the first place. And, and here's the, listen, here's the bottom line. That doesn't happen when we are locked in, committed to, given over to sin and selfishness. We simply cannot hold on to our lives and continue to give our lives over to sin and experience the fullness of salvation that God wants for our lives. Salvation is about life and all of its abundance. And this is what Jesus died to give us. And, and this is the last thing, in case you're keeping track and wondering you know, when you're going to get to eat lunch. And, uh, soon, soon, don't worry. Uh, last thing is the witness of our faith. That, that this salvation that, that God wants to work in our lives, that it is a visible witness to people. It is a visible witness to the world. This is what the scripture says. How can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Listen, when there is no real life change in a believer, when there is no movement in the mission of Christ in a believer, when, when the believer fails to live a life that represents the gospel well. Really what we're doing is we're denying that the gospel of Jesus has any power. And we are actually giving credence to the accusations and the lies of the enemy who says about the church, and you've heard things like this get expressed from the mouths of people, you know what, those are just a bunch of hypocrites. They don't really believe that stuff. They don't really believe it. That's not... That's not real to them. They're just a bunch of hypocrites. And, and we actually give credence to the accusations of the enemy. But where there is a real demonstration of faith, where there is fidelity to Jesus, where there is a life of love and integrity and service and goodness and humility and kindness, there is a display of the very glory of Christ. People are actually drawn to Jesus because they see Him who is the object of our faith, they see him in our lives. He's a witness to the world. But here's the other thing, and I promise, this is the very last thing. I promise, promise. <laughs> um, I don't think the Lord wants us to actually close today without acknowledging not just that our living faith is a witness to the world, but that actually our living faith is a witness to us, a witness to our hearts. That is, that is, that our living faith actually brings us assurance of our own salvation. And I, and I want to explain what I mean by that because I, I don't want you to take it in this way. What I'm not saying is that like if we do good deeds, we get merit badges. You remember merit badges? I, I, had a, I was a Cub Scout and a Weebelow. I had all those you know, little pins and stuff. It's not like that, right? It's not that we earn something so that we can say, ooh, well, obviously I've got enough now. It's not about that at all. But what I mean by it is this, that when we are walking in humble obedience to the Lord, when we are following His Word, when we, are, when we are following the promptings of His Spirit to do those good works He's prepared in advance for us to do, what we find is that the God of the universe is working in our lives. And there is nothing that can bring us assurance of our salvation that is more powerful than that witness actually knowing God working through us. When we love and serve somebody in Jesus' name, we are actually experiencing what it is for the love of God to flow through us and to them. There's nothing like that, right? 
when the Lord points out something to us in his word, you know what, this doesn't belong in your life. We need to get after this. I'm going to give you the power to defeat this. And we actually yield that to the Lord and we see him giving us progress year by year, decade by decade, giving us more and more of the heart of Jesus, making us look more and more like him. There is nothing that brings us an assurance of faith like that. This is what the scripture says. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. This is how love is made complete among us. There's that word complete again. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. How do we have confidence on the day of judgment? This is what it says. In this world, we are like Jesus. In this world, we are like Jesus. What we find is that when we are walking humbly with the Lord, He actually changes our lives. And more and more every day, we are finding that more of the love of Jesus is making its way into our hearts. And therefore, we are finding a great assurance in this fact. And so, let me just say this to close. Let us not be just hearers of the word, but doers also. And let us not trample on the grace of Jesus Christ. Let's not dishonor the sacrifice of his cross by saying something silly like, Jesus, I want your salvation, but I don't want all of you in my life. Jesus, I want your salvation, but I don't want to give all of myself to you. Let's not trample the grace of Jesus like that. Instead, instead, let us walk in trust and obedience, working out our faith as a witness to our culture, but not just that, as a witness to ourselves, our very hearts, that we actually belong to Jesus and we do belong to him forever. May it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you would, let's please pray together. Lord, we are so grateful to you because you're so good to us. You've provided the way of salvation even though there was no way for us to do it. There was nothing in us that merited it. But you, just out of love, you have provided the way, and we know that his name is Jesus. And we pray in his name for the fullness of faith and salvation in our lives, to be restored to you, to walk with you daily. Lord, we pray that you would make our lives to be a visible witness to this world. And Lord, we pray that you would work so powerfully in us that we would have such a confidence, such an assurance, because each and every day you are making us a bit, a bit more like you. And we pray for all of this in the name of Jesus and to his glory. And together we say, amen.